This is your essential guide to token creatures and winds of exchange. Let's get sweaty. Welcome to Keyforge Public Radio with your host, Zach Armstrong. Token creatures. A lovely mechanic introduced in Winds of Exchange, Keyforge's sixth set, and they are just so much fun. In this episode, we're talking about all the rules which apply to them so that you don't get caught unaware by these rules, especially in a competition with some stakes. What we're not talking about today is strategies in particular with token creatures and how to use them in a particular deck, or what they do, or even rating them. We're going over everything you need to know to just functionally use these in a game, all the way up to all the weird little rules that you don't want to get caught unaware by. If somebody uses Temporal Purge to move Captured Amber into the common supply instead of your pool, you're going to want to know that before it happens, because that would be a feels bad. Starting from the very beginning. What to do when you make a token creature. So this is going to happen through card effects, it will say, make a token creature. Maybe there's a prerequisite, maybe something happens afterwards, but you make a token creature. And when you do that, what you do is you take the top card of your deck and place it face down, exhausted, onto one flank of your battle line. Pretty simple. Every deck with a token creature is going to have a few features in there regarding your token. There's going to be a token reference card included with the deck. This card itself won't ever be played or put into play (laughs) as a token creature in your battle line, but it should be easily visible to all players near the play area so that when you make a token creature, everyone knows exactly what power, armor, traits, and abilities that token creature has. Since on the battle line, you're looking at something without that information on it, right? The backs of decks with token creatures has the token creatures art on the back, which is great. It's very pretty. And the house of the token creature overlaps that art on the back. A very nice touch. Now, I should note here that in official organized play, you must be using opaque, as in can't see through them, sleeves. So this art is only really useful when you're playing outside of organized play without sleeves or with transparent sleeves. Lastly, the token is referenced on your deck list that's associated with the deck. In the bottom left, you're going to have a couple pieces of information regarding the token. Uh, The name of the token, the symbol of its house, the token's number in the set, and then there's a little symbol denoting a token creature reference card. Kind of like uh, an action card or an artifact have those symbols from Dark Tidings onwards, there's one specifically for the token creature reference card. This name of the token and all this information is in the bottom left separate from the three lists of the 12 cards creating your three houses. So a couple scenarios that you need to know is, of course, um, as we mentioned right at the top of the episode, when you make a token creature, you take the top card of your deck and place it face down exhausted on one flank of your battle line. The first situation you're going to run into uh, with this even most basic of rules is what happens when there's no cards in your deck. You just have a discard pile, some artifacts and stuff in your battle line. There's no cards in your deck and you're instructed to make a token creature. Here's the thing. You actually fail to make a token creature because there's no deck. And per the rules, the only way except through card effects, of course, uh, card effects that say shuffle your discard pile into your deck, the only way you flip your discard pile over into your deck and shuffle it to draw a card is if you try to draw a card and your deck is empty. Making a token creature is not trying to draw a card, you're trying to do something else, and so that effect unfortunately fails. This matters because you're going to need to be counting the cards in your deck, you're going to need to be you're going to need to be aware of whether or not you can make a token if that gets empty because you draw during a turn somehow. And it also matters because let's say you have a card that lets you make two tokens and you have two cards left in your deck. Uh, You know exactly what those two cards are and that they're about to become tokens because you can count everywhere else you have cards and figure out exactly what two cards are left. Something else really important with this is the fact that this set has plenty of enhancements. Enhancements, of course, uh, come via the enhance keyword on a number of creatures like Kelpminder and Steward Suzanne probably getting that pronunciation wrong, and it they have enhanced with a number of different kinds of pips after them. Draw, amber, that sort of thing. And those pips are, of course, randomly distributed on any of the cards in the deck. You've probably seen this, gotten some really exciting enhanced creatures, that sort of thing. What this is really helpful for is you might be in a situation where your deck is really low or maybe it's empty, 
And you're in a situation where you would need to try to draw a card so that your empty deck is replenished by that discard pile. You draw one and then you have a deck to make token creatures from. Pay attention in your Winds of Exchange decks to any cards with those draw pips on them. Of course, this draw pip might eat up the rest of your deck and then all of a sudden you can't make token creatures. But maybe that's good for your specific situation. Or maybe you can sequence it properly so that you're using that draw pip to flip that discard pile back over into your deck so you then have a deck to make token creatures from. This is one of the most basic rules around token creatures that you need to make sure that you're familiar with, that no token creature is made when you have an empty deck, because the only time you flip that discard pile over to turn back into your deck is when you try to draw, and there's nothing there. The next baseline rule with tokens that they interact with, which is really important, is that tokens are put into play. They are not, quote, played. I'll say that again. Tokens are, quote, put into play, not played. In Keyforge, the difference between these two is very important. So whether something is put into play or it is played, it has entered play. Entered play is this umbrella term that has both played and put into play under it. And when you make a token from the top of your deck, it is put into play. So anything that says you can't play a card, you can't play a creature, uh, that does not apply to making a token because those are put into play. However, anything that says after a creature enters play, that still applies when a token hits that battle line. So we're going to go over a couple things related to put into play versus played because this difference is really important. One of the rules this applies directly to is the rule of six, which reads a player cannot play and or use the same card and or copies of that card by name more than six times during a turn. Classic examples of this that you might be familiar with are the Ganger Knot combo using Ganger Chieftain and Drummer Knot to combo off between each other with, against an empty board so that you're uh, uh, trying to fight, but then you reap and you bounce it. I won't explain the entire thing here, but you end up hitting rule of six with uh, at least the Ganger Chieftain or the Drummer Knot. You also have the Grey Rider combo against an empty board, where each Grey Rider is a small creature with play after fight after reap ready and fight with a neighboring creature. So when you have two, they can play next to each other against an empty board. And since you cannot fight against an empty opponent's battle line, they continue to try to ready and fight with each other. But all they get to do is ready. They don't get to fight. And so then you can reap and trigger that reap effect to ready the other Grey Rider. It tries to fight, but it can't. You reap with that, and you keep going back and forth until you have played or used Grey Rider six times. And of course, Grey Rider is a normal creature. You're playing from your hand, and you're using as normal. So playing it from your hand onto the board and any uses count towards that rule of six. So that rule of six is very useful in Keyforge because of the nature of the game and the way the cards are designed for the game. You could easily have an infinite situation like that Grey Rider situation, where if there was no rule of six, those Grey Riders could go back and forth uh, until you had uh, thousands upon thousands of Amber, just picking, picking some arbitrarily huge number, right? So the rule of six is there to keep that from happening. Six is a nice round number. If you're getting one amber off of each, you know, uh, uh, use or play here, then you're getting up to six amber, enough for one key. I think it's a very well-selected number, a very graceful rule that helps Keyforge exist in a healthy state. But what does this have to do with tokens? Well, first, uh, because put into play and played are two different things, and the rule of six says a player cannot play and or use the same card and or copies of that card by name more than six times, putting a token creature into play does not count against the rule of six. Let's say you already have six prospectors, for instance. Uh, that's a token creature in Winds of Exchange. Say you already have six on the board and you reap with six of those uh, each one time. You've now played or used, in this case, just used, prospectors six times. So you can't play or use any more prospectors. However, if you want to go ahead and create more tokens, you have some effect that lets you do so, you can do that because those tokens are being put into play, not played, and thus the rule of six does not apply. Which then leads us to a bit of a more philosophical point. Why are put into play and played two different ways for a card to get to the play area in Keyforge? Why are those both enters play? There's that third term that covers them both, right? Put into play, played, both are enters play. Why is, is all this slightly different, slightly umbrella categorized, and maybe slightly confusing language? Why is that being used? So no designer has commented on this publicly as far as I'm aware, 
But this design space really helps keep a particular aspect of Keyforge really healthy in that the active player makes all decisions and the difference between enters play and played helps keep that simple. And when something enters play, the play effect does not happen. And that is why we have put into play so that play effects can be skipped and it doesn't create all these cascading effects on an opponent's turn. That way, you can have effects like Amber Lucian, which has Omega and says play, destroy every creature in play, uh, reveal both players' hands, put into play each creature revealed this way. If I'm playing that on my turn and you have a whole lot of creatures in your hand that have play effects, then we're having to put those into play and resolve those play effects. And it just gets messy because there's lots of play effects that let you do things like play extra cards or play a card from your discard pile, all this sort of thing. So if you have puts into play that turns off all of those play abilities, that lets you safely do some interacting with your opponent on your turn, not in a way that gives them any choices, but in a way that skips all of those abilities that would otherwise really confuse the game state. So that's why put into play is there. It's so that your opponent's cards can come into play on your turn without any of those effects triggering in, in a way that would really start to confuse confuse the game state and create a whole lot of weird and wacky rulings. For one specific instance, there's a card that's actually designed around this, Jar Goggle. It's a creature and it has two abilities. The first is a play ability. So remember, if it's put into play, this won't trigger. And the play ability reads, put a card from your hand face down under Jar Goggle. That's simple enough, right? The second ability is destroyed. If it is your turn, play the card under Jar Goggle. Otherwise, archive that card. I'll read that second part again. Destroyed. If it is your turn, play the card under Jar Goggle. Otherwise, archive that card. You see what they're doing there? They're nearly telegraphing the design space here. They could have simply written destroyed. Play the card under Jar Goggle. And that would mean if your opponent destroyed Jar Goggle on their turn and the Jar Goggle is yours, you get to play that card underneath Jar Goggle. And maybe it's something that lets you ready and reap with another creature. That's just, that's going to create a whole lot of um, confusion as far as uh, active player choice and resolving abilities on your opponent's turn. So they kept this simple where if it's not your turn, that card just gets archived. Those play abilities are not coming out uh, into the play space. So in Winds of Exchange, there are a number of cards where this difference between put into play and played with tokens is crucial. Because remember, tokens are put into play and they enter play, but they are not played, right? So we're going to use a couple of artifacts and then a token itself, actually, to illustrate this difference. Because a token creature can dodge a Quixelstone, but it can't dodge an auto cannon. <laughs> a token creature can dodge a Quixelstone, but it can't dodge an auto cannon. Autocannon reads, after a creature enters play, deal one damage to it. And so this covers put into play and played. So anything that's played normally from your hand, regular creatures, that's going to get damaged, obviously. But with tokens being put into play, which still counts as enters play, they're going to take that damage after they come into play, no matter what. So whether that token is made on your turn or your opponent's turn, if there's an autocannon out, that token creature is taking one damage. Quixelstone is worded a bit differently, of course. If a player has more creatures in play than their opponent, they cannot play creatures. If a player has more creatures in play than their opponent, they cannot play creatures. So remember, ha ha ha, token creatures, they are put into play. They are not played. to take that, Quixelstone. Trying to play the control game with me, I have token creatures. I can make as many as I want to. Uh, of course, every token creature you put into play is creating more opportunity for your opponent to go ahead and play their own creatures out, but that's probably fine. I'm not here to give you a strategic recommendation on what to do with Quixelstone and token creatures, but uh, with Quixelstone's restriction on not being able to play creatures, token creatures get around that. So remember, a token creature can dodge a Quixelstone, but not an auto cannon. Lastly, we're going to look at a final illustration here with a token creature itself, the star of the show. This token creature is from House Sanctum, and it's Cleric. Cleric is a one-power token creature, human-traded, that reads, after Cleric enters play, capture one amber. Most other capture amber effects that we see on creatures say play, capture amber, of some variety, right? Charette from Call of the Archons, Old Bruno from the same. Usually they have play, capture some number of amber. Cleric is worded differently, and it seems maybe a little... Uh, 
seems a little strange at first, after Cleric enters play, capture one. But this is written specifically with that put into play versus played dynamic in mind. Because remember, token creatures aren't played, they are put into play. And all of that is enters play. All of that is enters play. And after Cleric enters play, capture one. So Cleric is going to be capturing one no matter what, whether it's made on your turn, whether it's made on your opponent's turn, that Cleric's going to be doing its job, being Amber Control and Token Generation all at once. Pretty cool. I like this token. I don't know how competitively viable it'll be. I think there'll be a couple corner case decks out there that make some wonderful use of Cleric. It's a very cool token. It's a very cool token, and I hope it actually turns up in some really strong Winds of Exchange archetypes. Just a personal hope of mine. Another rule I've mentioned a few times is that active player makes all decisions. That's something that is core to Keyforge, it's very important in the rulebook. The active player makes all decisions. When it is not your turn, the opponent is making any decisions uh, that need to be made as far as card effects happening with choices that are in them, right? And so when a token creature is made during your opponent's turn, your opponent is going to select the flank any token creature is placed on, even yours, because that is a choice happening during their turn. They're the active player. And so they would have to pick left flank or right flank as those are made. Uh, An example where this might happen is the unfathomable creature Camelotti from Winds of Exchange, which has the destroyed ability make two token creatures. So if you kill Kamalani on your turn, of course, you are the active player, you decide which flanks those token creatures are placed on, one at a time. Now, the reverse is true, of course. If it's your opponent's turn, and they kill that Kamalani, the destroyed ability triggers make two token creatures, they have to select what flanks those token creatures go on. You do really want to pay attention to this in case it matters. For instance, if you want to make sure your opponent is staying low on token creatures, right, and you're controlling the board, maybe you've got some fighty Brobnar out, and they have a Kamalani out, you might want to fight that Kamalani to go ahead and trigger that destroyed ability to make two token creatures so you can then play an action card or fight with a different creature that's going to wipe those token creatures out. Always better to do those on your terms than allow your opponent to have options, especially if those options can lead toward a big play or a big out, right? So what you would want to do is go ahead and fight that Kamalani, pick wherever those token creatures are going to go, whatever flank they go on, and just ensure that you can get to them, either with your action cards or your fighty creatures that are going to go take them out. And I will note here, as far as the active player having to make this choice, both players are responsible for maintaining a legal game state in their own games at all times. This is on rules page 14 of version 17 of the rulebook. So this means if you're creating token creatures during your opponent's turn, you do have to ask your opponent what flank the token should go on. If they're a little confused, simply explain it's active player's choice. This is up to you and your integrity as a player to go ahead and make sure that your opponent is picking the flank. Uh, that is that is something you have to maintain to maintain a legal game state. If they have a question about it, your opponent has a question, simply explain, hey, it's active player choice, this flank or that flank. Another fun interaction with token creatures is if a control is swapped, right? Maybe you've taken control of an enemy creature, maybe your opponent has taken control of one of your creatures, and if those creatures are token creatures, they retain their identity that they had when they were created as they move around the board. So this means if you take an opponent's creature, Uh, say, a raider, right? One power unfathomable token. And maybe they've taken control of your prospector token, the one power token creature with destroyed draw card. And if those have perhaps swapped control, that raider is still going to be a raider and that prospector is still going to be a prospector. They aren't kind of blank token creatures that are just imprinted upon by... uh, Um, imprinted upon in the moment by whatever your reference card is they are created as that creature and they stay as that creature until they exit and then revert to their printed card type so good to know if you're doing a lot of control swapping equidon has a lot of control swapping in this set so it'll be important to remember that if you're sending something over to the opponent it is retaining its original token creature stats it does not morph into whatever token creature the opponent has The next rule we're looking at is a really interesting one that I actually discovered for myself when I was researching this episode. And so this is a really important one I really want you to commit to, and I want you to commit to doing this in casual play so that uh, if you are trying to be a more informed Keyforge player and playing in a tournament, that you don't make this mistake in a tournament because it would be fair to call a judge on you for this if you mess this up. And it's a really simple one, and I used to do it all the time with token creatures before I found this on page 33 of version 17 of the rule book. The FAQ entry reads, when I make one or more token creatures, can I look at both sides of each card before I place it in my battle line? 
The answer is no. The card is not a token creature until it is in play in your battle line. Only then can you look at the reverse side of the card. I'll read the question again. When I make one or more token creatures, can I look at both sides of each card before I place it in my battle line? And the answer is no. So the habit that I developed that maybe you developed too is that as I'm going to make a token creature, I've just some effect has triggered of, of creating a token creature, right? Uh, I will kind of take the top card of my deck and I'll look at it and I'll say, okay, that's the card on the other side. That's the printed card. Now let me select where this goes as a token creature. But you are not supposed to have that information until that creature is already committed to a place in your battle line. You are not supposed to have that information until that token creature is already committed to a place in your battle line. So practice this now. Get used to it so that you don't mess up in a tournament. Whenever you're making a token creature, don't look at it. Pick a flank, and then once it's committed to a flank clearly and obviously, then you can look at it. I will note here as kind of a tournament etiquette note on top of just bringing that rule up to people who might not have heard it is that it's very possible this rule might be overlooked by a handful of players you end up facing in a tournament they might not have read the rules that deeply i certainly didn't before i was even researching this episode and perhaps there's some poor unfortunate soul who just has not listened to keyforge public radio yet so first you know fix that send them a link and second while there's no need to remind a player of any particular rule even this one at the start of a game especially in a competition, just assume they know that's their responsibility to come in knowing the rules. If your opponent does peek at a card that's going to become a token creature, I recommend you gently ask them to pause. No need to be dramatic about it. Gently ask them to pause while you call a judge over. No need to be dramatic about it. Just clear and gentle and timely, and the judge can explain the rule. The reason I recommend that you have the judge explain the rule is the judge does not have a stake in the outcome of the game, and you do. Now, that being said, perhaps you have a rapport with this person, right? Even if you just met them, maybe you're, you're getting along. And so it's, it's really up to you how you want to handle this. I think it's clearest if the judge comes over and just explains the rule so it can be explained by someone without a stake. It keeps you totally above reproach, right? Um, it helps the judge be the person uh, giving the rules instead of you, who is a player in there. Um, but if you if you feel like you can handle it yourself with that person, that's totally fine. I would recommend just a really uh, easy, gentle judge call. No, no reason to hold it over this person's head, right? It's a very easy rule to miss. I haven't seen it discussed a whole lot. Okay, our next token rule is that tokens revert to the card they originally were after they move to an out of play area. Okay, this is an interesting one. It doesn't matter in, it's not gonna matter in every game, uh, but it is important to know. So what this means is that the token creature is considered a creature with all the stats and details it had until it moves to the out of play area where then it reverts back to the card it was before it became a token creature. These out of play areas are your hand, the discard pile, your archives, your deck, and purged. So you likely understand intuitively that if a token creature is returned to your hand, it becomes the card it was before it was tokenized. And you don't have to put it in your hand facing the wrong way around or anything. You can simply put the card up into your hand as normal. This applies for the discard pile and purge as well. Go ahead and flip the card to its normal side as you place it in that zone. Uh, just know that for the purpose of timing and card effects, it is a token creature that's moving to that zone. And then once it's in that zone, it reverts to that printed card type. Of course, if the token creature goes back to your hand or your deck, you don't need to show the card to your opponent. But purged and discard are public information. So if your opponent, you don't have to volunteer the information, but as the token goes there and goes face up, your opponent might ask what it was. Uh, so do show them that is public information and you're responsible for responding to any reasonable inquiries about that, right? One in-game example of this is a kind of hilarious one with a Dark Tidings rare General Sherman. This is pretty funny. So General Sherman is a 10 power beast rare creature from Dark Tidings, and it has the playability purge each other creature. If General Sherman leaves play, return to play, each creature purged this way, exhausted and under its owner's control. So if you have a bunch of token creatures out and General Sherman comes in and purges all of them and they're in, you know, they're in the purged zone purged by General Sherman. Most people represent this by putting them face up underneath General Sherman. As soon as these cards are purged by General Sherman and reach that purge zone, those token creatures flip and revert to their original printed card type. So they're no longer creatures. They're an action card or an upgrade or whatever. That's not a creature. Maybe they were a creature, right? 
So if General Sherman then leaves, and now we have this lasting effect trigger where we have to return to play each creature purged this way, it's each creature purged this way, and they have an FAQ on this, which is great, where you then take all those cards that were purged by General Sherman, all those token creatures especially, and you take those and you try to put them all back into play. Anything that isn't a creature, though, can't return to play this way and remains purged by General Sherman. So if General Sherman is in the meta, if you were bringing a General Sherman deck or you're looking at a deck list across from you and it's got a General Sherman, whether somebody is bringing it or perhaps it's a legacy in, in a game and not available, something like that, just, just keep that FAQ in mind. And perhaps this fun little story uh, will jog your brain enough that you know you need to uh, go ahead and ask a judge real quick. Hey, judge, what's that ruling on General Sherman? And tokens just so you can be equipped to know exactly what that interaction looks like in case it matters for your game. A much simpler in set example for of exchange, of course, is something like Sandhopper. We love Sandhopper. It's an Equidon artifact that says action, return a friendly creature to your hand. If you do, you may play a non-Equidon creature. So really simple, really straightforward. You can return a token creature, of course, and as soon as it's in your hand, it reverts back to its original card type. Maybe it's an Equidon action you want to play this turn. Maybe it's a non-Equidon creature that you now get to play based on the rest of Sandhopper's ability. So really clear example. That one's pretty intuitive, but I wanted to cover it just because that's technically the token creature reverting to its printed card type, just like any time a token creature ends up in the discard pile, which, you know, they do a lot. There are board wipes, there's Brobnar, there's all sorts of things that's just going to be sending them en masse to the discard pile, but they did a good job. Lastly, we have flipping a token or non-token card. Okay, this one's pretty fun. This one's pretty wacky. If an ability instructs you to flip a card, that card remains in the same position it was in the play area, and the card is placed with its opposing side face up. Any tokens and counters remain on the card, and their effects are applied immediately, say if they were plus power or things like that. Upgrades attached to the card remain attached to the card as long as it remains in play. Now, of course, as long as it remains in play is uh, something that's applicable to if you have a creature that is, if you have a token creature that is being flipped and all of a sudden it's no longer a creature, it's say an artifact or an action card, that upgrade was only attached to it because it was a creature, it's no longer a creature, all of that is going to be discarded. Cards that are flipped are not considered to have entered play in any way or have left play for the purposes of card effects. So if a card that is flipped is not eligible to remain in its play location, like I was just mentioning, that card is discarded along with any upgrades attached to it. Any tokens or counters on the discarded card are moved to the common supply. I'm going to read that last part again. Any tokens or counters on the discarded card are moved to the common supply. But wait, amber tokens are, you guessed it, tokens move to the common supply. But that creature was destroyed or otherwise leaving play wouldn't that amber move to my pool instead because i i worked hard for that amber they captured it from me onto their star lines token and now they played temporal purge and flipped it and it was an action card what's happening you're going to remember a rule if you've taken a deep dive into keyforge rules before about amber on non-creature cards this was referenced in things like redacted the logos artifact where you put an amber from the common supply on it when you call logos and so the rule for non-creature cards with amber on them is that if they're destroyed or they leave play, that amber goes to the common supply, not your opponent's pool. Of course, on creatures, if there's amber on creatures and that creature leaves play, all that amber goes to their pool instead. So if you're, th if you're seeing all the pieces that we're putting together here, you're going to already understand why if you flip a token and it's a non-creature card and it moves to the discard pile, any tokens on there would move to the common supply. Because as you flip it, now that's not amber on a creature. It's amber on a non-creature card. And so when that has to move out of play to the discard pile, guess what? That amber, that's going to the common supply. Really, this is more of an edge case with something like Temporal Purge. It is a rare Star Alliance action in Winds of Exchange that reads play. Flip each token creature face up. Put each non-creature card flipped this way into its owner's discard pile. So there is an edge case here where you capture, uh, where you capture onto a token, right? Say you're in Star Alliance because you've got to play Temporal Purge later. So let's say you use something like... Um, Xeno training to capture a couple of amber onto a card. That's capture one for each house among friendly creatures in play. So say you capture a few amber onto a cadet, the one power star alliance token creature, and then you play temporal purge and you flip that cadet upside down. It's got amber on it, but oh no, that's an artifact under there. So that artifact moves out of play because it's not eligible to stay in play 
in the battle line, which is instructed in the Temporal Purge, which is very helpful. That way, you can actually turn that capture into Amber Loss when otherwise, under more normal game circumstances, it would simply go back to your opponent when that creature leaves play. All right. Well, that was a bit of a marathon. Thank you so much for sticking with me on this long episode where we go through all of the rules for token creatures and winds of exchange. I hope you feel equipped. And at least if you didn't memorize all of them off of this one episode of listening to me, you can either uh, re-listen again before a tournament if you need to brush up on it, or just use it as a reminder that you know there's special rules around flip. You know there's special rules around purge. And especially uh, not to peek at tokens before they're in play. Maybe you just remember that all of these are rules and that you need to look them up before you're getting into uh, a game of some kind to make sure that you're playing your best, you're playing the right way, and you're finding all the outs your deck has for you, and you're avoiding getting outruled. And instead, you can use the full knowledge of the rules to outplay your opponent instead. I'm honored that you chose to listen to Keyforge Public Radio. Hopefully you feel a little bit more informed. And if you have a question you'd like to submit for the mailbag, go ahead and do that at keyforgepublicradio.com. Click the microphone in the corner, and that will send a voicemail directly to me, and I may end up using it on a future episode of Keyforge Public Radio. Keyforge Public Radio is produced by Rooster High Productions, which is me. If you have any questions about how a podcast produced by me could serve your business, organization, or expertise, send me an email at zach at roosterhigh.com. To support KPR in our mission to provide the community with resources and raise the profile of this amazing game, join the Patreon, where you will vote on what content is next, discuss the show and share ideas, and receive discounts in the merch store. Speaking of the merch store, what better way to show off your love of Keyforge and this show by buying a KPR hat, shirt, or even a pair of sandals? On our website, KeyforgePublicRadio.com, you can read show notes, blog posts, and more, so give that a visit. Stay engaged with the show by following us on any social media platforms you frequent. Just search for Keyforge Public Radio. And remember, dear listener, the most important part of Keyforge is the person across the table.